Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Welcome to tonight's edition of Seekers of the Supernatural. Before we start the program tonight, I'd like to thank a few people, if I may. I live in New Milford, as most of you know by now, near the Roxbury Line. Today we were out of power from about 8 o'clock in the morning till about 3.30. But I'd like to thank the Northeast Utilities, the phone guys, for working diligently to put that power back onto our house. They were very nice about it. I guess a tree on Route 67 in uh, Roxbury fell, hit two poles, knocked both poles down about 8 in the morning. And uh, they were very courteous uh, when I called, and they said the power would be on by 4 o'clock, and guess what? It was on by 3.30. So I'd just like to say thank you to Northeast Utilities folks and to SNETCO. Tonight's program is going to be one that we're going to continue on from our last show. It's about the Donovan case in West Hartford. According to Ed and according to Lorraine, it's probably the most horrendous case they've been involved in in the past 25 years. Oh, by the way, my name is Tony Spera. <laughs> I'm your moderator tonight. Of course, with hosts Lorraine Warren and Ed Warren. Ed Warren, of course, is a demonologist, has been for more years than he'd like to count, but only one of seven in the nation. Lorraine, as you know, is a clairvoyant, a psychic, and a light transmedium. Perhaps the most famous couple in the world who live right here in Monroe, in the Newtown area. People all over stop Lorraine and Ed and when they go to the diner, when they go to a restaurant. And Ed and Lorraine are very gracious, very friendly, and Ed likes to kid around with people. But you know something? Their job is very serious. Just like police officers who go out and risk their lives every, lives every day, and firemen, but they have that sense of humor about them. You know, a lot, of, a lot of cops and a lot of firemen like to joke around. Because their job is so serious and because it's so stressful, that's the reason they have to blow off some steam. I know it sounds redundant, but it's true. Lorraine and Ed go through a lot, have been through a lot, have been almost killed in various cases. That's why Ed likes to have a sense of humor about him. But this case tonight, the Donovan case, is, I believe Ed said, on a scale of 1 to 10, a 10. So what I'm going to do is I'll have Ed recap just a little bit of the Donovan case before the deliverance happened. Uh, we're going to read a little bit about the deliverance, which is the exorcism itself. But Ed, uh, up to that point before the deliverance, how, you know, what was going on exactly? Well, it's the old story, Tony, you know, the Ouija board. Now, people, again, often say, come on, it's, it's a board with some letters and numbers on it. So what? The kids are playing with it. It's an invitation for spirits to come into your life. Mm -hmm. And that's what people do. God does not allow you to be haunted or possessed or oppressed indiscriminately. Right. You have to uh, invite it in. This young girl invited it in through the, the Ouija board and uh, nonsensical questions, and she was getting answers. And uh, suddenly, some of these answers were very factual. And when somebody does you a favor, they expect something in return. Well, what she got in return wasn't so good. Her home was almost completely destroyed, a beautiful home. Furniture smashing, breaking, um, pictures flying off walls. Uh, one night uh, seeing what I can only describe as an old man had me pinned into a corner with a chair. Um, Watching this family so terribly frightened, so terribly terrified that the mother, father, the son, and the daughter, the son at that time I believe was 15 and the girl was 19, but she was more like uh, somebody 10 years old, mm -hmm. a very simple girl. And uh, they would all go into the bedroom. This is what I, what I suggested. They would put a cross on the door. Mm -hmm. with holy water, they would have to stay awake all night long because as soon as they start to drift off to sleep, the mother, the father, the daughter, the family dog, on the bed, one bed, mm -hmm. the boy alongside in the sleeping bag on the floor. Oh, boy. As soon as they would start to drift off, pounding would start mm -hmm. all over the walls. Then it would hit the bed to the extent that it would knock down the bedboards. This family was 
crucified, I have to say crucified, for weeks. They didn't understand what was going on. They were too embarrassed to tell anybody until the man of the house told his boss, and he knew who Lorraine and I were. We went to the home. We brought Father Charbonneau with us, a young priest at that time, who had studied at the Pontifical University in Rome under Father Resch, a very, very notable mystic, in fact. He had recorded more spirit voices, mm -hmm. over 10,000, while he was there at the Pontifical University than any other psychic researcher. But it was this young priest that went in with us that was so astounded by what he'd seen and what he experienced. This was his first case that he ever went into. Mm -hmm. He asked Lorraine and I if he could go in on a case with us. We took him in on a case, I want to tell you. You say it's a one to 10, it's a one to 20. Stones fell on this house. They would appear about 20 feet above the roof of the house, come down in a slow zigzag manner, defying gravity, hitting the house sometimes very softly, but other times breaking windows. Water would come out of a wall where there were no pipes for water. These are called apports through teleportation. Uh, the crockery, woman's grandmother's antiques, in a china closet, Suddenly, the whole thing goes over and smashes and breaks. It doesn't matter if it's from the 5 and 10 or if it's your grandmother's antiques. A hi-fi set, the girl's hi-fi set, lifts up and smashes the pieces on the floor. The father buys her another. Same thing happens again. Knockings, bangings all over the house, pounding like a gigantic fist, hitting the walls, the ceilings, the floors to the extent that it would actually crack the walls. <clears throat> now, these people out there are saying, my God, what's this guy on? That couldn't happen. Well, to prove our point, <clears throat> we love to bring in news media. People often say, oh, the Warrens want a cameraman in back of them. You're darn right we do. Because what better proof do you have than an unbiased cameraman or some talk host that walks in that place and he sees the things you're seeing and experiencing, and this man then goes on the air and talks about it. Well, that's what happened. And actually films on, it. On yes. three occasions, they filmed it, they talked about it, it was on the news. But they never revealed. But they never revealed. Where it was. The uh, location of the house, which was the deal we made with them. Eventually, uh, we did bring a priest in, Father Charbonneau, he had stayed there a few nights, witnessed things that were simply incredible, and uh, he did perform an exorcism. But there was another Some people person. call it an exorcism. Lorraine, I have to tell this. Do you mind? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I was just going to say, that's funny. about the longest I've ever heard. She's I've not heard Lorraine speak. <laughs> <laughs> was, was that? Her father was like that when I think he that was about, you know? a little over four minutes. <laughs> over four, four minutes, minutes. Without, you, without you uttering a sound. I think that's a, that, that's Her a, father came over the bar. Record. He'd do the same thing. No, he did not. He's <laughs> terrible. Anyhow, make a long story short, uh, Father Charbonneau did perform an exorcism, which was filmed. Yeah. Channel 3 filmed it and showed it a couple of times on television, and then they erased the film. They erased the film for the 11 showing news. objects moving the, across rooms. For doing another 11 o'clock news broadcast. A cameraman was in the hallway, and I was in the bedroom with the mother and the father sitting on the bed and the daughter and the dog. Suddenly, the bureau moved towards the bed when I was using religious provocation. The drawers were going in and out faster than you could count. We've got film of all this stuff, you know. This isn't something that I'm just talking about and blowing off steam. We have film of these types of phenomena. Doors opening and closing. The bureau comes towards the bed, hits it. A brush comes off, a hairbrush. Whizzes past us, goes down towards the open door where the cameraman and the other two guys are, almost hits this guy. He runs from the house, never came back again. He did. Jeez. He did. He you ran. can't understand what it's like until you actually are in a home where poltergeist activity is concerned. Now, there's a chance that Lorraine and I might be going to Tokyo, Japan. If we can get the time, we, we're going to do that because of a poltergeist, mm -hmm. a Japanese poltergeist. Now, how are we going to talk to this thing, Tony? 
Do you know Japanese? You do. Let's hear some Japanese. I know a little. I want to hear you say something. How much is this item? <laughs> okay, how about, the one, sayonara, how, about, right? how about the one you used to say to the geisha girls? <laughs> sayonara. <laughs> yeah. I don't not what you, it's not what you told me. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. If, when you go there, just you know, bring me back a souvenir, okay? Right. We will. Uh, I'll bring you back some chopsticks. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be fine. Uh, what I'd like to do is just read the end of this part here, because I think this ties into what you were saying. Ed. It says here, and it talks about Good Friday. Yes. For the Donovans that year, Good Friday, April 12, mm -hmm. was a day of abject fear. A forbidding atmosphere enveloped the house. Indeed, it seemed as though the whole place might suddenly explode as the berserk rampage continued unabated. Stones mysteriously pummeled the house outside, while unrestricted bedlam went on within, mm -hmm. all of which was now compounded by an evil presence so incredibly real and physical yes. that no one dared to be alone in the house for even one moment. Right. The Donovans, frightened and tormented, now had only one hope left, the Warrens, whoever they were. Like, they didn't know you at that time. They, they found out who you were. Yes. Now, <clears throat> it says here on April 12th, this... This part is called deliverance. Right. It says inside the LaGuardia Airport terminal, enough people to fill a small town milled around waiting for planes to either come or go. Outside on the observation deck, the air was thick with diesel fumes and the screaming whine of fan jet engines. Off to the left, the Manhattan skyline was silhouetted against the setting sun. Above in the twilight sky, incoming jets approached from the west, turned right over the white stone bridge, then one by one drifted slowly back down to earth. But then it says here, on board that big tri-jet touching down just after 6 that evening were, guess who they were? Were Ed and Lorraine Warren. I hate planes. Coming, I, I know you do. Coming, coming uh, home after a 10-day speaking tour, mm -hmm. they delivered six lectures in four states, appeared twice on television, answered three hours of questions on a radio call-in show, visited a not very haunted house, and granted four separate interviews to student newspaper reporters. That sounds par for the course for our schedule. They're glad to return. The Warrens look forward to spending Easter Sunday with relatives. On Monday, they'd be off, this time to Maine. Around noon on Saturday, the following day, Lorraine received a call from a man beside himself with fear and anguish. In her pleasant way, Lorraine calmly asked, could you explain your problem as specifically as possible? And then for a quarter of an hour, Ted Donovan unfolded a tale almost too incredible to be believed. Yes. He told her of the slashed tires, remember? Yes. The vandalized engine yes. we talked about? Yes. The cost that cost over five hundred dollars to repair. Yes. He told her of the ketchup, salad oils, bleaches, perfumes that floated down the hallway mm -hmm. and dumped their contents on the rugs and expensive furnishings. Mm -hmm. He told her that a statue, an anvil and refrigerator had moved on their own accord, mm -hmm. that heavy furniture had levitated, <clears throat> that stones had fallen on his house, and that water plowed from the walls, flowed from the walls. He couldn't stand it anymore. He pleaded for help, offered to pay anything, anything for it. And at first, uh, it says you were struck that Ted Donovan's imagination had run wild. That's what you thought. Mm -hmm. But by the time he had finished, it was evident to you that this man's home was under diabol diabolical siege. Ed is involved in another case this Saturday, you told yes, uh, Mr. Donovan. he was. However, we would be able to come to your home on Sunday. And Ted, of course, immediately agreed. What happened on Sunday when you went there? We met him in West Farms Mall. That's where we met. In I can the continue it, Lorraine. In the shopping center. Should I talk? Should I talk, honey? <laughs> in the shopping center. If you don't, you're just going to hear all the way home in the car. <laughs> <laughs> in the shopping center, uh, we met him and went to the house. When we arrived at this really beautiful home, Tony, uh, everything was covered with gook you know, where salad oil and uh, mustard and everything, where they kept trying to take it off the rugs, off the, this beautiful velvet furniture Tooth that paste. was toothpaste. It was, it, it was terrible. And what would happen, Tony, is that these liquids would all mingle together. It, at times, I have to tell you, at times it would become so frustrated, you'd become so frustrated when you were in this house that for me, I broke down and cried a few times. It was, really? It was that emotional. I told her if she can't take it, get out of this It's work. It's a very emotional thing to see a family that's you know, horribly you know distraught. What the people out there right now are thinking, 
what this woman was saying. We'd love to say. No, they wouldn't. Yeah, they would love to say it because no, it's no, proof no. of what we're they talking about. They think they, these people, you think you would love to see it. You would not love to see it at all. You would not. If you have knowledge and you are there to gather evidence in order to help a family, you don't want to see a family this distraught and it can now, get on your nerves. Let me ask you this. When, you, when, you, when you're in that house, did, can you sense can you sense anything? Oh can yeah, it's evil? overpowering evil, Tony. What, the is intelligence. Is there a way to describe that feeling? Is there a way to describe? No it? compassion. No compassion. No. Of evil. Think of a person no. with absolutely no compassion. That is complete evil. Those spirits in that house, which they call a poltergeist, is complete evil. They destroy anything. It doesn't matter what it is. And the more you suffer the better they like it. But what is it that invites these spirits into a house? In this case, it was a Ouija board. Can Any excuse anything? to get into that house? Mm -hmm. Does that mean that they are constantly around us waiting for just some opportunity to enter your life positively? Yes, they are. Yes. It does. Yes, it does. So let me ask you a question then, Ed. Not, not to get off it, but thinking good thoughts brings good, good spirits? Attracts we'll good. Say. Like attracts like. Always thinking negative, negatively would bring, well, would bring what? Would well, bring bad for well, instance, when, when people hate, for instance, right? Who are they hurting? They're hurt, hurting themselves. Because the, the person that they hate doesn't even know they hate them. So they're hurting themselves. When they do that, their whole aura changes. Diabolical spirits can see the anger, the hate. Mm -hmm. So they start to oppress that person's thoughts. Cruel things horrible things come into this person's minds. This is where your murders, your suicides, all these types of terrible things happen because this person is suddenly in such a state that he's wide open for any type of evil spirit to come in and oppress his thoughts. So do you think like these mass murderers, these guys who walk into a, uh, a place of employment that they work yes. at and gun down people, in the it seems indiscriminately, yes. or they pick them out even, yeah. you think they're... And then they're not judged insane. Uh, well, you think they're, they're not they're, insane, what are they? Then they're probably diabolically oppressed, Tony. You think it's that oppression you just spoke about? Positively. Yes. Now, oppression for the people out there who don't know what we're talking about is very similar having an invisible being alongside of you, projecting thought to you constantly, kill this guy, he's no good, do away with him. Mm -hmm. The world would be better off without him. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of thoughts that you're getting. Some people carry those out. But they're not your own thoughts, Tony. I mean, it's like just forced into your mind kind of a thing? Well, you have, you and have. And then a lot of people say, I don't remember a thing about what I did. Well, that's different. Yeah. That's not going into possession. Yeah. Because they weren't there when it was happening, like Arnie Johnson in the Devil Made Me Do It case in, Conne in Connecticut here, in Brookfield. That boy came under possession. He was forced out of his physical body. This spirit took over, took his arm, took that knife, and plunged it into his friend. We could so have he, proven that. He didn't even know what he was doing. No. No, he did he, not. He wasn't he was doing playing. it. His physical body was doing it. Yeah. But he wasn't doing it because he wasn't in that body. No, because he was basically a very I good person. I met Ernie Johnson. Yeah. Oh, he's several a good times. Ernie Johnson. Nice very kid. Nice, very nice kid. He's a very Super nice, nice kid. I always said that nice he was kid. like the all-American kid. He is. Loved fishing. Used to take uh, Debbie, his girlfriend, fishing, go to baseball games. Yeah. You know, all kind of trophies. The kid was great. Yeah, he's, he's a non-violent person. not the kind of person. kid that would kill anybody, No, me. he's a very non-violent. So he was pos absolutely possessed, huh? Yes, he was. He Positive. has no recollection. And we could have proved it. When we went to that court of law that day, if they would have let us bring in the seven Catholic priests, the psychiatrists. Who were they? All the witnesses, the recordings, the family, mm -hmm. the neighbors, everybody who witnessed all these t horrible things happening. That boy would have never went to jail. Okay, now the Donovan case didn't really get to that point where there was a murder or anything, but you brought okay. a priest in. You brought in Father Charbonneau. Yeah, and there was another priest what did, working by proxy. Another priest, what, did he, what did he have to do in that he house? He performed what, an exorcism. What, tell me about that a little bit. What was that? He performed an exorcism in the living room of that house. Was he exorcising the house, Ed? The yeah. father, the priest? Yeah. yeah. Or was but he exorcising the, house was the people, too? Infested. Well, he blessed everybody. He Even didn't perform door. an exorcism on the people. He because them. they weren't possessed. He blessed them. No. But he was performing exorcism in the house. And we were there. See, we tried to be part of every exorcism 
that's, that's performed like this, Tony, because we've been involved. How long did the exorcism take? Took a good part of the morning. And on the floor, they had all very light color carpeting, which, by the way, was totally ruined. And hmm. your stereotype devil head with horns formed, and what it looked like, the substance that it used, the medium that it used, was like ashes. That's what it looked like. Dark, dark ashes. Was there a Father Jason in there? Father, was the way what they called him Father Jason? They called him Father Jason. Because it says Father Jason was affected in a rather more sinister and ominous way. For the past two weeks, he had witnessed the most incredible phenomena caused by the demonic. This theological devil had taken on real proportions, and he truly felt in danger. Mm -hmm. Indeed, a spirit from the Donovan house had followed him, too. You mean something followed the priest? Yes. Oh, yeah. Father Bill was affected a great deal, a great deal by his work, which is one of the reasons priests very, very seldom stay at doing exorcisms, Tony. Now, what's this? What's, I'm just reading here something about Ed. Uh, I'm just I'm going right into the middle of something here, and it says, Walking through the house, Ed found beds turned over, drawers pulled out, yes. linen scattered everywhere. Indeed, anything movable seemed to have been ripped, torn, or turned upside down. In the kitchen, the contents of the pantry and refrigerator had been dumped in a pile on the floor, mm -hmm. with dinner plates and silverware, heap, silverware heaped on top of that. Sheer insanity. Heading back down the hallway, Ed suddenly realized something was awry. A moment later, the house began to violently rumble and shake mm -hmm. as if an earthquake had just struck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fearing the house might actually collapse on top of him, Ed tried to get out, get to the front door, but he couldn't move. Mm -hmm. At the same time outside, the rain picked up on the fact that Ed was in jeopardy. When she and Father Jason reached the front door, they saw Ed walking dazedly through the living room, his shirt covered with blood. Upon removing him outside, they discovered on his left arm two long, mm -hmm. deep slashes forming the sign of the cross. Yeah. Yes. So what did. was that all about? Uh, well, and, and let me tell one part of this. Tell but me. wait a minute. Before you even say that, uh, Lorraine, may oh. I just interrupt? Go. Refusing to see a doctor, Ed had them wash off the wound the and then bandage it tightly with gauze and tape from the first aid kit in the car. Ed explained that quote, psychic slashes started to be thrown around the room, cutting into the walls and drapes. And it says he was cut on the arm because he threw his arm up to cover his face. Mm -hmm. Feeling that the forces in the house intended to mutilate him, mm -hmm. Ed believed the attack was directed specifically at him, for it was he who originally challenged the forces in their home with religious provocation mm -hmm. and who threatened to end their rampage by alerting church authorities to the case. That's true. That's very true. Now, it was summertime, and Ed never wears long sleeves in the summer, as you well know. But all that time, he wore, he wore long sleeves. And the only one that he allowed to look at that cross, the only thing he kept using on it was holy water, by the way. And the only one he showed it to was Father Charbonneau. He didn't show it to anybody else. What are, this, are these really, go really gouges or, or scratches? What, what are they looking like? It feels like a burn. When I held my arm up like this, it felt just like a burn. Uh, then I could see it was a cut. It was a psychic slash. It was actual bleeding. cut. Yeah, it was oh, yeah. all over him. With blood. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was all blood. How long blood. did that last before it went away? Tell well, it lasted about three days. That's, that's right. That's I, all. I, I never put anything antiseptic on or nothing. I just used holy water. And when it disappeared, there was no scar, no nothing. No. Because I understood what was happening. How many times have you had that happen to you? Oh, God. Maybe. Thrown across the rooms, uh, knocked down stairs, punched in the face, arm twisted up in back of me. I got to tell you that it must be at least two, three dozen times things happen like that to me. Wow. But okay. that, that in, this, in this house, this, one night in this house, Tony, you know, we're always asked, Ed and I separately are always asked, what is the most frightening thing you ever experienced in your work? I know what you're going to say. And that's where it happened. About the dematerialization. Tony, if, if that doorway, that door over there can dematerialize in front of me and the molecular structure of it can break down, and seconds later, Father Bill and the man of the house open the door going down to the basement and the, and the uh, doors are there. If that can happen, it can happen to me. In other words, dematerialize. But you know, they, the yes. people now are saying, she never seen that. That can't happen. Of course I've seen that. The molecular structure of that door can't break down. Well, they performed a test in a poltergeist ridden home. They had cameras set up. They had put these little dolls 
inside of a, a fish tank and they covered it over, sealed it tight. The camera actually picked up when one of the dolls suddenly just disappeared and appeared in another part of the room. Mm -hmm. That means that the molecular structure of that doll broke down to the extent it could pass through solid matter like the glass and be teleported to another area. So what she's talking about, we have scientific. Have problems. you ever seen personally at uh, you in a house, we'll say, or Lorraine, besides the door, anything dematerialize and reappear somewhere else? I can't no, even, that you can remember. Not, not to that extent. No, I mean, I was, I was right there alone in that. I mean, uh, nobody was there until they yelled, the priest. But you saw the, you saw the door disappear. First, I heard heavy metal hit a wood floor, but there is no wood floors. Everything is carpeted, but that's what you hear, Tony. Then, I, as I looked, that was beginning <clears throat> to break down all in waves. Huh. It was breaking down. Then I, 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 you gasp what, what you're looking at, you know, and you don't, you're afraid to get up or move or anything. You were going to say something, Ed. I was going to say about the night that we were coming across a bridge, very similar to that one that's in uh, Bridgewater there. Right. Big bridge. And just about oh, yeah. enough room for two cars to get by or a truck and a car. And this truck came hurtling right towards us. I said, this guy is going to hit us. I moved over to the left, and the truck moved over to the left. No. I had a choice. I could go off the bridge or hit this truck head on. I stayed with the truck, and it disappeared right in front of our eyes. That's something that appears and disappears. That was it's a, a phantom telepathic truck. object. Yes. It's, a, it's yeah. what we call a phantom truck phantom. or a phantom car. So it wasn't real, but you yeah. thought it was real. Not real, yeah. yeah. Well, the image was projected to us bypassing the physical eye, going into the mind's eye or the third eye. So in other words, an unexperienced person or inexperienced person would have off the, off the, off the bridge, bridge and killed themselves maybe. Yeah. But you were smart enough to know this thing must be... Not real. Well, the way the truck, it was all blacked out. The lights were on, but it just wasn't natural. It was coming right towards us. Then it would switch over to, when I went, went over to the left, to come back to the right. I said, I've got no choice. I can't go off this bridge. Nothing. Went right through it. But the same thing happened when we were coming home one night. It was foggy I'm from 84. this house that we're talking from about. Donovan's. Yes. Yes, I'm 84. I had this uh, Chevette, brand new, and I'm driving along. I know this tractor trailer truck's in back of me on Route 84, and I can see maybe 30 feet ahead of me. And all of a sudden, I see this car in the middle of the road. In the middle of 84. I could just make out the silhouette, of course. No lights on it. Just a black shape. I thought, the guy broke down. I swerved away from him. Luckily, where this occurred, there was grass. I went up onto the grass and came around and spun around. Hmm. Got out of the car, and I thought, this guy must be crazy. I walk over there. There is no car. There's no car there. We've both seen car. that. A phantom car again. Yeah. 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 You know, we're just about out of time. So we've got to wrap this up. Maybe the next program we'll just finish up a little bit on the Donovans just yeah, to clear it out. Yeah, because it's so much to it. Uh, which is just an amazing case. Lorraine, you want to give the P.O. Box really quickly? Yes. Ed and Lorraine Warren, P.O. Box 41, Monroe, Connecticut, 06468. For Ed Warren, for Lorraine Warren, for Charter Cable, I'm Tony Sparrow. Have a pleasant evening.